patient could have significant neck or back injury. He's having difficulty breathing. And I didn't hit him, man. Other people did. Any slight movement could possibly cause further damage to their spinal cord. And I look out, out of the corner of my eye, I see something in the water. I look over, I see a jet ski. It kind of looked like it was going to cross our path, and I realized that it wasn't going to cross the path. We were going to run into each other. Before I could say anything, the jet skier hit our boat. In this exclusive footage, we see the collision. The PWC on the right of the screen is traveling west as it collides with an 18-foot passenger boat. Luckily for the victim, lifeguard Mike Manley is only 20 yards away when he witnesses the accident. I was on patrol in lifeguard vessel Guardian 1. I just see a PWC and a vessel collide. The operator of the PWC was in the water. He was conscious, in a lot of pain. Guardian 1 on scene, Fiesta Bay. PWC collision. I need medics to ski beach dock and other units. It's going to be a sea spot in the water. Lifeguard Steve Orlowski pulls up on his rescue boat within two minutes. I'm on scene. We got one guard with the victim. He's already in times four. He's got a broken arm, broken leg. We're going to take sea spine in the water. Officer Manley was in the water. About 30 feet away from the hull of an overturned PWC was a gentleman screaming, what just happened, what just happened? His leg hurt, his leg hurt, don't touch me, don't touch me, leave me alone. We had a lot of wave motion and, and turbulence in the water. Saw a lot of pink in the water. I, at that time, decided, you know, for airway precautions, C-spine precautions, we're going to be kind of pushed away. We need to get that guy onto a boat. He just reached over the gunnel on his vessel, handed me the backboard. He, he seemed to be in shock. He's kind of worried about a lot of other extraneous things other than exactly what just happened. Together, Manley and Orlowski get the victim into Rescue West and begin first aid. And on his right knee, there was a pretty significant abrasion. He was saying that he couldn't move his knee. And then I saw on his right arm, close to the elbow, his forearm to the bone, kind of filleted open. So we, we wrapped it and stopped the bleeding as quickly as possible. There's a lot of blood. So we cleaned that up and wrapped it up, realizing that there was some leg damage on his right leg. The victim has experienced major trauma. Manley and Orlowski are concerned about internal injuries. The lifeguard fireboat arrives and escorts Rescue West to the dock at Ski Beach. It's all open there. This is just wide open. Yeah. Okay. How's your thigh? Is it your knee? No, no, it's just my knee. OK. Yeah, I'm going to your toes. Negative toes. else. The victim is alive but in shock. And it's unknown if he has any internal injuries. I'm gonna run you up to the hospital. Get checked out. I don't wanna go to the hospital, man. You got it, man. You got it. Pretty significant injury. Yep. Yeah. Because it happened in front of us, we were right there. So we cut a lot of time off that golden hour. You guys, uh, you guys probably got blood on you. Uh, you have an hour to respond and get that patient to ultimate care of the trauma surgeon. Watch your feet. Watch my feet. Yeah. All right, Bert. Let's go. It's not a matter if someone will get hurt. It's a matter of when. 5323, 40-year-old male with possible dislocated shoulder at the wedge. Lifeguards arrive on scene to find the surfer with severe pain in his shoulder. We sat him down onto the top of the berm, and uh, we treated him right there, where we had him hold his shoulder in a position of comfort. We stabilized him and got him out here to the medics. Did you hit the ground? Yeah, I just wrenched and it popped, so I think I got my upper humerus. He was in a substantial amount of pain. He said a 9 out of 10. Yeah. Any pain back here? Can you feel fingers here? Let's see if I can get a blood pressure right. through this wetsuit sleeve. The victim is in need of a higher level of care. Before transporting him to the hospital, Medics must splint his arm to prevent further injury. Goodness gracious. This ever happened to you before? Not even close. Moving the victim's damaged limb increases his pain. The fear that he might slip into shock is now a reality. Have you ever had morphine before? Once. I'm just going to give you five milligrams at first. The morphine quickly kicks in, but the victim's pain remains high. On a, pit, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt, where would you say you are right now? I was at a okay. 9. You were at a 9, so we've only gone down 1. So far. All right. The surfer is now stable. 
Lifeguards opt to move him off the beach to the local hospital. This is really shallow, it's a really dangerous place, and that's the result is we have injuries here routinely. And luckily it wasn't his neck, it was just his shoulder, his dislocation, he'll recover and he'll be back out here. 90 miles south at Sunset Cliffs, a 27-year-old man has shattered his ankle jumping off the rocks. It's a beautiful spot, but the beach here is very remote. There's not a whole lot of access to it except one steep trail that people use a rope to get up and down. The victim is at the south end of Garbage Beach. The best way off this stretch of sand is a steep trail 200 yards to the north. Not only will lifeguards need to transport him to the access point, they will also need to get the victim up the 100-foot cliff. So we're going to go ahead and utilize the litter wheel, put the stretcher on top of the litter wheel, and uh, walk the patient to the base of the cliff. Paramedics and lifeguard Ryan Graves package the patient for transport. That's going to go that way. You put your left foot inside. There you go. Due to the condition of his ankle, the medics must first administer morphine to ease the intense pain. The victim arrives at the foot of the cliff's access point, but he is not out of danger yet. The vertical haul could injure his leg further if not done with care. Okay, ready to haul. Haul away. Hauling, hauling slowly. Hauling slowly. I became the rescuer at the feet just to get up to the first flat section. And then Lance Mendoza and I took the patient the rest of the way up. How are you doing, Kevin? No problem. Okay, we're stopping, taking a bite. Keep it. Keep going. Keep going. Once the man is brought to the top, paramedics transport him to a waiting ambulance. All right, good luck, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. The wedge being the spectacle that it is, it draws a, a huge observer crowd down here. And uh, for the most part, people are, are wanting to have a nice day, watch the surf and, and be excited. Occasionally, tempers run high and, and people will get into it with each other. Get the out of here, bro! Get the my way! What are you gonna do, bro? What are you gonna do? I was on the tower and uh, initially I broke up the, the altercation when it just began. The two gentlemen had exited the water and were beginning to fight. Any time at wedge, when the surf gets eight to ten feet or larger, big egos come out, and when those egos collide into each other, we get fights on the beach and in the water. After that small altercation was separated, the two gentlemen found each other on the back of the beach. One of them threw a punch, which knocked the other guy to the ground, and he hit his head on a rock on the way down. While lifeguard Joseph tends to the victim's bleeding head, lifeguard Bob Maripol arrives on scene and quickly radios for additional police support. 5323 requesting PD for surfer altercation behind the wedge tower. When I drove up, there was a guy who was bleeding from his head. He already had a bandage from the tower guard. The tower guard was treating him. I didn't even touch you, man. You did, homie. Oh, yeah. yeah, you did. My main concern at that point is to make sure there's no more fighting, because we don't need anybody else getting hurt, make sure the lifeguards aren't involved. Hey, officer, that's the guy that attacked me hey, right don't there. Worry. Yeah. They're, they're he had blood trickling down from the top uh, right side of his head, down his face. His, his nose was bloody. He had blood coming out of his mouth and blood all over the front of his wetsuit. With Newport Beach police now on scene, the two men involved in the altercation are separated and questioned. And I didn't hit him, man. Other people hit him. I just put him in between the things. I don't know what really what happened. Yeah, we I was like, do something, bro. You want to? You know, you're arguing all day, do something, bro. I'm not scared of you. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, like, sock me or something right here. And I fell on the rocks or something. People tend to get their adrenaline pumped up, and then blood starts flowing, and there's only so many waves that come through. And it's a very individualized sport. You can't share a wave. Our primary concern down here is public safety. That's in the water, on the beach. And we do whatever we need to do to make sure that people stay safe. Two dogs have gotten into a fight at the crowded dog beach. When one owner attempted to intervene, the larger dog attacked her. Tower guard Melissa Jester is on scene treating the injured woman. You do need stitches. Bartlett arrives on scene, and lifeguard Jester updates him on the patient. 
there's like a bunch of bigger dogs, and then my dog was just like oh, no, no, curious, he and he went one. and like was I'm sniffing around. The dog just the bit him. And then I went to grab my dog, and he reclamped with my hand on my dog. How bad is it? You think it needs some stitches? Yeah, it's all the way to the bone. All the way to the bone. It's from the tip all the way to the face. Okay. All the way right above. That's a pretty good laceration. It requires immediate medical attention. It's the whole nine yards. The victim must get to the hospital quickly or risk possible infection. I'll go ahead and transport the patient back up to 22 in the service road. I can meet you there. It's uh, too difficult of an access in this area. While medics assess the patient, animal control arrives to speak with the other dog owner. Anytime that there's a dog versus human and a person gets bit by the dog, the standard operating procedure is that the dog that bites is quarantined for the first 72 hours pending the outcome of the victim. Regardless if the dog has had all its inoculations. So, we can drive to the closest hospital or we can get you walk you to your car and you can kind of... The only thing is I have two dogs with me. Yeah, we can't bring the dogs yeah. there. Unable to part with her beloved dogs, the woman elects to drive herself to the hospital. It was the other girl's dog, a 75-pound American Bulldog. It's only 11 months, so it's a pretty big dog. I haven't seen the dog. The husband has a dog up here somewhere. You guys might have drove right friends? past him. It's typical when you get a dog right. fight, the owners get involved, and someone gets hurt, and then usually well, you take that another fight. You want, to, you want to put your hands in there and realize. Yeah, it's not a good idea. Here's mom right here. Mom right here? Okay. What's her name? Yeah, I don't want Actually, go, go ahead and just, I'm gonna go ahead and put a little uh, dressing on top of it, okay? Okay. So what's happening is that she's at the, the, the tips of her fingers. Yes, well the air is touching the tip and it's that's what's causing all of her pain. It was new instantly. It's what we call a full thickness burn, which means this went through her skin down into her nerves. It's a bad burn. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put this one on instead. I wanna cover up her whole hand, okay? Okay, it's hurting a little bit. Underneath the sand was a layer of hot coals. She put her hand on there and that completely burned her hand, burned all over it. Did you get did you have any more owies anywhere else on your hands or on your feet? No, no more always? Was just just your hand? hand? Anytime you get a burn, the clock's ticking, you need to get it to the burn center as soon as possible because every second goes by, that's more damage done to your hand and it could be irreversible. Oh, okay. Todd makes the decision to move the victim off the beach where paramedics are waiting. Hey, we're gonna go with mommy inside the lifeguard truck, okay? Mom, we're gonna go in the, the front seat, okay, mom? We'll come together. It's extremely hard to stay calm during situations, and uh, I know for a fact that if I start freaking out, then it, it, the whole scene is going to go downhill. So it's it's almost you have no choice but to stay calm and make sure that you give that little girl everything you got. It's okay. It's okay. Don't I know. I know. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, we have a solid second, third degree burn to her, her almost her whole right hand. Nothing on her elbows, her hips are all fine. It's just all in that one area. Uh, patient contact time at 1849. On scene, the medics evaluate the victim's vital signs and decide to administer morphine to reduce the excruciating pain. I was really fighting back tears almost that whole call before the medics got there and, and gave her the morphine because I knew that's the only thing that's really gonna help her. Yeah, try, try to keep okay. your arm down too. It's okay. Yeah, just keep, keep by your chest. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That wasn't a routine burn. That was a significant burn. Her road to recovery is going to be years. I guarantee she's going to have skin grafts. And uh, the good news was that she was able to use all of her fingers and she was able to move her hand. But the bad news is it's, it's going to be a scar there for the rest of her life. Lifeguard Lonnie Stevens is patrolling the ocean on Rescue West when he hears the call. Dispatch to one Sam for a report of a medical aid. It's going to be a 20-year-old male collided with another, uh, indicate traumatic injuries due to a fall and a loss of sensation on the leg. We were less than two minutes away. Rescue West copy. Do we know if the victim is still in the water? On a ledge, there was a male 
who was laying on the rocks. He had been extricated from the water already. I determined that he's conscious and breathing, and then I try to get a quick background as to what happened and what his primary injuries were. Jet 1 arrives to back up Stevens. Copy this to rescue us on dispatch 2. 16-year-old patient is down just above the jumping spot on a shelf here at Osprey. He's oriented times three, neck and back pain, and he's having difficulty breathing. This patient could have significant neck or back injury, and any slight movement could possibly cause further damage to their spinal cord. So until we have the patient completely packaged in the sea collar and mobilized to the backboard, we take great caution not to move the patient any more than, than we have to. Paramedics quickly take over care, evaluating the injured team. Lifeguards have set up safety ropes to prevent rescuers from falling. It was a very difficult area to access. Trying to extract them around slippery rocks and up basically a 10-foot ledge could be very um, difficult. From there, we have to think about, OK, well, how are we going to extricate? And so the option that was decided was to call a helicopter and do an air evacuation via the helicopter, which is a bit tricky. Helicopter pilot Eric Connor and medic Chris Sove are at Montgomery Field when they receive the call. The fire rescue helicopter surveys the scene and consults with Buchanan before deciding on an approach from the south. We're going to need them to do some crowd control. We're going to need everybody away from the cliff. Paramedic Chris Sove will be descending to the rocks. So once we started to make our approach and I left the uh, aft cabin of the helicopter, I don't have voice communication with anybody in the helicopter any longer. So everything is done off of hand signals. So I'm looking for uh, obstacles in my way of the approach as we fly in. And the first signal I'm going to give is when I'm 10 feet off of perceived obstacle or the ground. And in this case, it was the first cliff edge with lifeguards and their rope systems before we got to the, the other side where the victim was. So uh, I gave Captain O'Malley the 10 foot off signal when I was there. And as soon as we clear them, I give them the down signal. And uh, we go down uh, from there to the water's edge. Once I touched down on the ground and uh, secured myself to the safety, I had to do a quick survey, uh, just to investigate for any other injuries. OK, 16-year-old male, about 150 pounds. We'll need about five minutes for packaging. The 16-year-old boy is still having difficulty breathing. And while his neck and back are now immobilized, there is still life-threatening danger. The victim must be moved from his position and secured inside a Bauman bag. Transferring the patient quickly and safely is imperative. We take extra measures to make sure the patient is stabilized. His neck, his spine, everything is in line to prevent any further injury, making sure we keep the patient secure uh, all the way up to the helicopter. The victim is stabilized on a backboard, but the extent of his injuries is unknown. He needs higher level care quickly. Lifting the patient to the helicopter requires a high hover, an essential but risky maneuver. One hundred feet in the air, Chris Sobe continues to calm the nervous patient. Any sudden movement now could cause the two men to spin uncontrollably. With a, somebody with a spinal injury, we try and make that transition as smooth as possible and prevent any jarring of the patient. Our helicopters have the hoist mounted on the outside of the aircraft, which creates a little bit of a tricky situation once we pull on some straps to bring the patient into the aircraft. Go doors close once we get him back in so we can increase our airspeed. Lifeguard dispatch copies, patient extricated, transporting UCSD via Copter 1. I think that was a good role for the helicopter. And because of the training we've done with them, we know what to expect. And then we know what they need from us. And they know what, what, what we're going to be asking them to do. So it's, it's good teamwork, lots of training. And we'll continue to train because you need to keep the stuff sharp.